thank you all for being here. Um, I'm John Bertucci. Uh, I'm a media activist, uh, worked in Europe, working now in Petaluma with public access. Um, I had a pretty long speech prepared, but it's all been said. You've heard a lot of very important information. So let me just try to wing this. OK. What, what does Fukushima mean? You know, we use that word, have you heard about Fukushima? Uh, do you know what's happening in Fukushima? Well, Fukushima is a prefecture in northeastern Japan. It's where Basho hung out. He wandered around and wrote haikus. It also, Fukushima means lucky island. So we're, we're talking about something sacred and pure and really beautiful that I think we've lost forever. Because there was a nuclear plant in Fukushima pre prefecture called Daiichi. And there was another one south of that called Daini. And Daiichi had a massive uh, accident. Three reactors uh, lost their cores. Four, four units blew up and there's spent fuel pools teetering 100 feet off the ground. Now Arnie Gunderson spoke to a uh, farmer in Fukushima prefecture who said fighting radiation is like fighting an invisible dragon. And that's what is loose now underneath the Daiichi plant, an invisible dragon that is devouring our ocean and our jet streams. I think of this invisible dragon and I think, how are we going to fight it? It doesn't, it doesn't operate in the same space-time that we operate in, that we've lived in. You know, Einstein said, time and space, that's poetry. I'll, I'll, I'll read a quote from him. Time and space are modes by which we think and not conditions in which we live. So the invisible dragon of Daiichi is living in this other reality. And it's, it's, we're on a collision course with that. So what are we talking about? You heard Carol, we're, we're talking about a new time, a new way. Perhaps time travel is something we should seriously think about. We have to find a new way to be present in time. I think we lost space. It's too easy to master by the thugs and the thieves. They've mastered space. They've built all the buildings they can finance and they've, they've got the weapons. So, I don't know, pardon? How do we, how do we respond to Fukushima then? I think the first thing, and Nick said it quite eloquently, don't try to do it alone. You'll, you'll go crazy. This is too heavy. Um, I'm part of a group. We, f we formed a group uh, early last year in Sonoma County called Fukushima Response. We came together um, inspired by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon who went to Daiichi in April last year. And he came back shaken and he, he was calling for an international response. And that kind of gave us a clue and we came together and started organizing. And we set ourselves three goals. One was to inform each other. We would meet twice a month and we would talk about what we knew and what it meant. And then we would mount uh, informational events and publicity promotional campaigns to try to inform others. And this coalesced into a lobbying effort, trying to get our elected officials to move towards an international response. Unfortunately, this did not get traction. We ended up, at the end of the year, everybody was talking about how it's all good, it's all over, it's in the past tense. Those poor Japanese, they had a nuclear accident, but uh, life goes on. We're dealing with an invisible danger, so it's easy to say that. And it's also a danger that takes time to manifest. So we, had, um, we hosted Japanese guests, we had Yastel Yamada come to the West Coast, or we Actually, Steve was very. Steve and Chizu were very important in bringing Yastel and Carol, and we brought him to Sebastopol, and and we really believed that this was a plan. He had a plan of retired engineers going in and working on the problem, thinking out of the box, organizing a unified response. What you have with TEPCO is a corporation, and it works in subcontractors. And those subcontractors, there's many layers, and each layer gets farther and farther away from a vision of what they're dealing with. Uh, it's incredible what, the, what has been going on. Um, you read a lot about 
leaking tanks of water. Well, that was a false solution in June of 2011. We're talking about chain reactions that are going to go on for centuries. <laughs> you can't pour water on it for centuries and think you're going to store that water. Uh, it was futile. But nobody wants to talk about the cores, the missing cores, which have melted into corium. So in trying to respond, we had to come to terms with what we're up against. And Steve said that quite well. It's a system. It's a corrupt system. It's a death system. It's, it's built on war and the war machine. We have the Prime Minister of, of Japan, Abe, had a very interesting month in September. On the 9th, he, he was in Buenos Aires to celebrate getting the Olympics because he lied. He said, everything's under control, and he got the Olympics. Now, this is a double-edged message. It's a message that everything's fine because the Olympics uh, committee thought it was okay. But it's also, think of the, the construction that's going to go on in Tokyo to build the buildings for the Olympics. That's where these people live. They're thinking short-term, profit, immediate. Ten days later, he went to Daiichi in a full hazmat suit with respirator for a photo op to project the image that everything's under control. It was so under control that they misspelled his name on his hazmat suit. And finally, on the 26th, he went to Wall Street to reassure them that investing in Japan and nuclear was still a valid option. So this is what we're up against. We're up against uh, an old system that will not be able to deal with the invisible dragon, but it does give us an opportunity to, to be the first ones into this new world or to, to navigate to this moment. We are the ones who were alive when this happened. There was another incident in the end of uh, 2012 Japan had shut down all of their reactors for maintenance, uh, for concern, for legitimate concern. And I think that they would have never restarted them. There was a, a strong public drive to keep them turned off. There was a general sense that they've suffered enough. They didn't really want them in the first place. And lo and behold, they got through the summer without them. And they had their electricity and their air conditioners. But this didn't sit well with the forces that are invested in nuclear energy. There's a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CIS, CSIS. And they put together a paper. It was actually authored by Richard Armitage, if you know that name. Yes. They went to Tokyo and they made them an offer they couldn't refuse. They said, you can't not have nuclear. I'll read it how they put it. Americans cannot afford from a security standpoint to have Japan abandon nuclear power. It's too important to us. So we, the United States, have got this game going back in, and it's because these people are not going to give up. And we have to find a way around them, through them, beyond them, deeper. I see us all as synapses in the group mind. We have seen something, we're, we're dealing with it, we don't know what to do with it, but th you can't do it alone, so there's a, there's a clue. Start talking to other people, group together, um, put on events. You know, Nick and Holly, they're out there at the shopping mall in hazmat suits handing out informational papers. I, the group I'm involved in, we set ourselves a goal this year. We, we had put on some major events, but we were only reaching 100, 150 people, and we were exhausted. So we sat around in January and tried to think how we could break the media sound barrier in a big way. And we came up with an idea. Basically, we started with the ocean, the ocean being the threatened body, a sacred body with its own power. And we worked with one ocean, one chance. And somebody had this idea, well, let's do a beach mural. How could we all go to the beach and write something? So we sat around, what would we write? And we came up with Fukushima is here. And, and trying to think of what that means, you know, the next speaker, Brad Newsham, 
a taxi cab driver, and the, the preeminent world specialist in human murals is going to speak next. So I'll let him talk about the action itself. But we worked on the, on the words we were going to say, and, we, and Fukushima is here. It's, it's a symbolic gesture of solidarity with the Japanese people. It's like, I am Bradley Manning, you know, uh, who stole the cookies, and we all step forward to say, I did. We have to take this on because, well, the Japanese, I, I've had many Japanese people send me emails saying, thank you for doing what you're doing. It, it touches them because they're alone dealing with this. Now, you've read about, maybe you haven't, uh, thyroid cysts in children, deformed babies. Um, there was an epidemic of nosebleeds that wouldn't stop in Tokyo. Now, Tokyo is about 150 miles from the invisible dragon of Daiichi. And if you think about that, that's like us with Daiichi at Lake Tahoe. It's pretty close. And it's way out of control. And these people are going to suffer. So I think standing on the beach with this message will communicate, and it will also invigorate your solidarity with the human predicament. It's also literally true, because we're talking about a time frame where this, uh, these chain reactions will continue for centuries. And it's going to be spewing and uh, generating radioactivity in a... Um, how did, was it put by somebody? We had a meeting this morning, and it was somebody who had been at the Monsanto march, and the connection clicked for her. She said it's uh, genetic modification of randomly applied to us. <laughs> okay? Helen Caldicott calls nuclear reactors uh, units um, mutation factories. So we're dealing with something that is going to have an impact. It's going to take time. It's invisible. But we can see it. We in this room can see that. And I think the burden then falls on us what we're going to do about it. I say work together with other people to educate and to break new ground and to explore new ways of being here. Be here now is a very uh, important thing right now. And you can't be here now without knowing about what's happening in Japan. What else did I have to say? Well. We're, we're already starting in Fukushima response. We're already starting to think about what our next campaigns will be. And I'd like to start a monthly discussion group where I can just sit in a restaurant and people can come and ask me questions. I mean, I read, I'm on this two, two hours a day for the last two years, and that's a minimum. Um, We had an idea, there was an idea voiced this morning at the meeting um, to apply pressure to Governor Brown to start a California statewide campaign to inundate him with messages of our concern. And if that were to accumulate and snowball, you know, we try petitions. Carol's got a great petition. She's, she's organized, uh, she's targeted the West Coast senators. Harvey Wasserman's um, Petition is immensely valuable. These are good mobilizing tools. They, give, they empower us because we are expressing ourselves, but I think they really need to be focused on a single point to, to make a difference. But the thing I'm really most interested in, knowing what we're up against and their tenacious uh, gra grip, death grip on our world that they've been pilfering for decades, is citizen monitoring of radiation. Now, there's something that we, one of the blessings of being a regional work group is we have one of the preeminent citizen, citizen monitoring experts in Sebastopol. His name is Dan Scythe. Uh, he has a company called International Medcom. He was uh, very helpful, very involved in helping citizen monitoring at the Three Mile Island accident. Uh, he's in Japan tonight. He left this morning. He's going there because SafeCast is getting a good design award for public service. He's also there to meet with the other people who have developed this system, and they're going to be installing um, monitoring devices very close to Daiichi. And they really want to get them up and get a baseline before the work starts on the spent fuel pool. Now, the, the trick with SafeCast, actually Dan was in Tokyo when the earthquake hit. And he was on the roof of a building with some pretty heavy players in the internet world. 
the head of Microsoft. Um, we have Ray Ozzi of Microsoft. We had Joy Ito, who's now on the New York Times editorial board. June Murai, who was the father of Japanese internet. And they immediately said, what can we do with our expertise? And they got together with some Japanese hackers and they put together uh, monitoring devices that were very mobile and very usable. And I actually just built one. Dan sells a kit that you can assemble yourself. And I did not know how to solder, but I do now. Uh, what's, what's special about these devices is they have GPS and satellite time and chips where you can get readings. I can drive around in my car with this and get readings that are identified as to when and where those readings were taken. I take the chip out and I feed the data to a collective database and you can track the, the situation. I'm, I got this, I think, early. I don't think we're in that zone yet, but I really want to know how to use this when we are. Because we are, going to, we are trying to set up a West Coast monitoring system. It's called a Nano uh, There are some uh, uh, links on the handout sheet that uh, Cynthia prepared. It's called a Nano Geige. It's made by International Medcom. And uh, check out uh, their links. This one was $450. And the, 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 the important part is the size of the pancake that's reading. Yes. What we're doing with Dan, we've gone to the beach, we brought back a debris, uh, we've gotten fish. To, to really test fish and food, it has to be overnight, it has to be in a container because there's a lot of radioactivity in the air. Um, Dan's also got devices that uh, can read uh, noble uh, gases. Um, if they're $5,000 a piece, but if we could get a grant and put 10 of them along the coast, we would get a very solid reading. Because I think we have to admit that our government is not gonna do this for us. They had plenty of opportunities to do it and they never went there. So I think, it's, I think we really should get to some Q&A, but uh, Brad is up next and uh, we'll talk about uh, the beach because I'd like to see you all there.